child, I was interested in science, um, and I was fortunate enough to be mentored by a, a physics professor, uh, Larry Weaver. And you know, he taught me um, the beauty of elegant theory, but he also taught me a, another lesson as well. Um, you know, one day he told me about a paper he was working on, and uh, a colleague had found a mistake in it, and I, I thought he was going to be upset by this. But instead, he was happy about it. And that, that made a big impression on me. And I, I, he really was an example of a commitment and to science as a collective search for truth. And you know, I think that's a, very, that's a lesson that I, I hope has stayed with me. And uh, my father is an architect. Uh, he, he taught architecture at Kansas State University. And um, he would, um, you know, watching him work on something as simple as a poster advertising someone's talk, someone coming to speak, and uh, seeing him design that and redesign it, um, you know, taught me the value of craftsmanship. And, you know, I, <laughs> my, uh, my co-authors, uh, my co-authors have noted that I, I sometimes want to keep revising things, so now they, now they know who to blame. <laughs> um, the, um, um, my mother taught literature, and you know, she emphasized our responsibility to address issues of injustice and suffering if we can. And you know, I think it was thanks to her influence that I chose the field that I wound up in of development economics. Um, and you know, the one wonderful thing about um, this uh, working on this uh, experimental approach to address issues of poverty is it allows both the connection to science, not, not physics, but, uh, but science in, in some way, or at least we aspire to that, um, but also the you know, more immediate and direct connection to uh, human beings and, and a feeling that um, we're working to try to address these, you know, these, these very important issues. You know, I felt uh, it was important to work on, on and address these issues uh, for, for a long time. Um, but after um, after college, I had the opportunity to teach secondary school in Kenya, and I, um, and then, then I went back to the U.S. I was involved in starting an NGO, then went to graduate school, eventually uh, finished and got a, a real job with a real salary, and then I could afford to go back to Kenya. So my wife and I went back to Kenya, and we visited some old friends of ours, and one of them, uh, Paul Lapea, had just been hired by an NGO. To, um, to help them start activities in Western Kenya. And the NGO worked on education issues and with school children. And um, Paul and I were talking, and it turned out that there was, um, he was supposed to choose some new schools to start working in. They hadn't worked in the area before, so they would have to phase things in over time. They had a particular program that they, a child sponsorship program that they were um, that they had done before, um, but they weren't sure what the impact was. And I mentioned that if they wanted to understand the impact, they could phase this in so that there was an initial group of schools where it would be phased in were comparable to a later group. Um, and that by doing so, they could have the equivalent of a, or something close to the equivalent of a medical trial, um, where there's a treatment group um, after at least during the early phase in period, only, only some of them would have been treated, and then obviously later more would be. But if they observed after the early phase, then they could try to understand uh, the impact. And um, they were, I, I didn't actually expect them to, I, this was sort of a, just a conversation with a friend. Um, I didn't expect them to, to go ahead with this. Uh, so I flew back to the US after my vacation, and then I got a call He'd spoken to his boss, and his boss had decided they wanted to do this. So I, I, uh, I flew back to Kenya and met with them, and um, we got involved in the evaluation that way. So that's a um, 
you know, that's, that's how we started. It was really a, um, a discussion with an, a friend who was working for an NGO, and then they decided that they wanted to, to understand the impacts of their programs, which I would really applaud them for, because um, you know, not, you know, not every NGO, not every government is truly interested in understanding the impact of what they're doing. But they were. And in fact, you know, when they learned about the results, they then decided they wanted to try new things um, to try to find how they could best serve the people that they, were, that they were intended to serve. And I think that turned out to be a very fruitful process. And they were able to identify more effective ways of, of fulfilling their mission and that would improve lives for more people. And ultimately, of course, that had a big impact not just on their operations, but most importantly on what the Kenyan government and other developing country governments were, were doing with their, with their own resources. And, um, and you know, that's, that's how I got involved. So um, I, I used to teach at MIT. Um, I was a junior faculty member there and Abhijit was a colleague of mine. Um, you know, um, I'll tell one, uh, one story. Um, so, you know, Abhijit was trained as a theorist. You know, I was trained as a macroeconomist. Um, you know, the, at the time, I remember I was doing some work on, um, very related to mathematical epidemiology. So I was um, doing some work modeling the HIV epidemic. And it turned out that I found an unexpected result. Um, that there were some circumstances in which if people had more partners, that could actually lead to the, um, to the, to the reduction of the epidemic, or in some cases to the end of the epidemic. So very counterintuitive. I was very excited about this result uh, because it was, you know, mathematically it was, it was a surprise, it was nice, Your very simple natural assumptions lead to a very counterintuitive result. I remember talking to Abhijit about it, and he mentioned something about how the best papers are ones where, you know, after you read it, you think, "How could I? How could I never have? How could I? How could we have not known that this was true?" And um, you know, that made me think and think back to the story I told about Larry Weaver. You know, this was something that was a mathematical possibility; it could theoretically occur, but you know, how important was it in the, in the real world? Um, or was it just a curiosity, a mathematical curiosity, or was it something important? And I think that you know, was another experience that tried, you know, maybe pushed me in the direction of trying to focus on what I thought was you know, actually important uh, for the real world. Um, and um, I think that's you know, part of why I wound up focusing more on, on this type of, uh, of work. Um, and you know, Esther uh, actually came as a graduate student uh, to MIT when, uh, when uh, Abhijit and I were, um, were both teaching there. Um, so, and we've been collaborators on, uh, on projects and uh, on a number of projects, and that's been a wonderful experience. So, yes, uh, you know, that's really a, a, huge, a huge perk of the job of getting to work with uh, such wonderful students. Um, so, um, you know, at this, I mentioned that in some sense, uh, Esther was a, a student. I wasn't her advisor, but we, we wound up, uh, I, I definitely um, met her when, you know, uh, when she was a student at MIT. But uh, um, there'll be some other uh, former students here um, joining us in Stockholm, including uh, uh, Ted Miguel. So um, Ted and I worked together on a study of, we've worked on a number of projects. Um, um, Two notable ones are a study of the or series of studies of the impact of um, of treating children for intestinal worms, um, such as hookworm, whipworm, uh, roundworm, schistosomiasis, um, and we you know, we found big effects of that, and then we found that those effects spilled over onto uh, onto neighboring uh, to others because of reduced disease transmission. Um, and then we followed this, this, this group of uh, children for you know, many years. And what we saw was improved educational outcomes, 
um, more likely, you know, the girls were more likely to finish primary school, go on to secondary school, and ultimately improve living standards. Um, so working with Chad over these many years has been a, a great pleasure, and uh, Pascaline Dupas will also be here. Um, um, Pascaline's done extraordinary work on a uh, number of areas, but in particular on pricing of preventive health goods. And you're one of the, uh, I think one of the most, one of the areas of greatest impact of the experimental approach. It's been, you know, there's some very specific things like deworming, but there's also some general principles. And uh, Pascaline's work has, um, has quite comprehensively examined the issue of pricing of preventive health goods. And, you know, um, Ted and I had an earlier result showing that pricing of deworming medicine had a very big impact on the number of people using it. So if it was, if you charged even a small amount, um, there was a huge drop off in usage rates. But then Pascaline launched a series of very nice projects that looked at many dimensions of the issue. Uh, she looked at mosquito nets and found similar results as, as we had on the one hand, but then added a very clever uh, as bit of design. So one of the, one of the, when I think when, um, when we started working on this issue, not only uh, multilateral organizations like the World Bank and governments, but also most NGOs had the view that it was actually very important to charge people at least something uh, for preventive health goods. And one of their rationales was, that if you don't charge for it, people won't value it and they won't use it. Now there was a lot of stories about things like this and people felt it very deeply. But as far as I know, nobody had ever tested it. And Pascaline and her co-author Jessica Cohen came up with a very clever way of actually testing that. Um, and they found no evidence for that story whatsoever. And subsequent research is, is quite consistent with that. Um, when, um, I'm not talking about in a laboratory setting, but rather in a, in a real world health setting. So then she went on to examine, um, are there benefits in terms of uh, motivating the providers? Um, um, she, a whole series of other questions. Um, does it affect take up later on? So maybe if you get, char if, if you get, char if you get used to paying for something, you'll continue paying. Um, in fact, it turns out that the free sample effect is stronger. If you give a free sample, then people learn about something and they're more likely to buy it later. So she looked at a, a whole series of questions, and uh, I think it's fair to say that the, the weight of the evidence from, you know, from the work we did, from the work she did, and the work many others have done is uh, consistent with the idea that um, you know, free provision of preventive health care uh, goods like mosquito nets or water treatment solution or, or deworming medicine is, um, is, has, a, has, has a lot of advantages and many of the hypothesized disadvantages seem not to, seem not to be real. Gender is a, a important, uh, very important area of, uh, of research and development economics and obviously a very important area of policy. Um, you're exactly right that when we studied the impact of deworming, um, we saw effects really differed by gender. Um, so girls were much more likely to, so both girls and boys stayed in school longer, but the girls actually passed more grades and were more likely to graduate from primary school and go on to secondary school. The boys stayed in school longer, but they tended to repeat grades. Um, and so in that sense, the program had a bigger impact on, on girls. Um, then um, when we looked at impacts, um, there were also, we also traced out the, the labor market impacts. Um, we initially saw what looked like stronger earnings effects for, for when they were, they were now men and women at this point, and uh, stronger earnings effects for men. Um, but over time, it seems that gap has, um, has, has, uh, is, is not, it's not so clear. Um, the, um, but let me mention things a little bit more broadly. You know, this is one example. Um, I think more broadly, it's in, in many settings, um, programs to, um, pro, 
we've seen big impact from uh, programs to, to, to increase access for girls. Um, so one, uh, another example is work um, on a uh, scholarship program for girls. So this was, this was um, a program that was put in place when, um, when there were fees for primary school in, in Kenya. Those fees have now been abolished. Um, but the program paid, said that for girls who were successful in school at up to grade six, that the fees would be paid for grade seven and eight, and also some school supplies would be provided. And one might think that the big impact would be on girls when they going on to seven and eight. But what we saw was actually an, in, that there was not only an improvement there, but there was an improvement in sixth grade scores as well, because I think the, you know, we, we looked at the mechanisms and it looked like students were studying more, uh, teachers were in the classroom more. The fact that people knew that there was an opportunity to go on to seventh and eighth grade um, if they were performing well in school led to um, you know, more, more, um, more investment in school, not just by the girls, but clearly by their families and by the larger communities, including the teachers as well. And we saw benefits that wound up benefiting not just girls, but the entire, the entire class and boys as well, um, presumably in part because if, if teachers are there teaching more, um, that's going to help boys as well. Um, so I, I, you know, more broadly, we've, I, I think that's a, a finding in the field. Um, you know, um, Esther Duflo, who's, who's was also recognized this year, has done a lot of work on this issue. And um, you know, one of one very nice paper she's done is on reservations uh, um, in in um, in and the local government for uh, for women in India, and what she found is that this led to improved provision of, of water because water is an issue that women care about. And a lot of people had thought that these uh, reservations of positions for women had no no impact whatsoever because they thought, well, the women are under their husband's control. Yes, a woman's officially sitting there, but it doesn't make a difference. And she showed that, in fact, it, it does make a difference um, and has some you know, very nice follow-on work showing that once one woman has done the job, then that opens up the path for, for, for other women and people's attitudes start to change a bit. Uh, right now, I like to sleep, <laughs> but uh, um, I, um, I, I like to you know, I enjoy, enjoy reading, and um, my mother taught literature, and, um, and you know, that's, that's something I, I enjoy uh, reading quite a bit. On the plane over, I was just looking, uh, I just read a, a little bit of it, but uh, uh, I was just looking at uh, 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 James Joyce stories. So.